Okay, perfect. This should be recording now. Perfect. Make sure I'm not muted. Okay, perfect. Can everyone hear me again? I had to leave because my Zoom app had stopped working. Okay, okay so, so does anyone have any questions about what we covered last class? So last class, we covered the concept of instances. And up until that point, we only really saw what static keywords were at the class scope. So we finally removed that. And we, and we saw, saw how we were able to utilize that. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, so with that said, that is actually the tail end, end of the final part of unit two. Unit, unit two, two is, is like mainly talking about methods and arrays for several, 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 several lectures. And then we gave a quick sneak peek into this concept of instances, instances that allow us, us to instantly go ahead and produce multiple, multiple copies from a class as opposed to dedicating a full, full class for one of our data, data models. models. And that motivates, motivates our, our next unit. unit. And for that, and reason, for that reason, I'm going, I'm going to, to likely go, go ahead and release the unit two task uh, today uh, af after lecture, and I'll make that available to everyone uh, probably until next Friday. So, so you'll, you'll have, have a full week on the unit two test. And all I can say is it'll be very, very, very similar, similar to the unit one, one test, test, which means don't, don't wait to the very end to fill it out because it's a long, arduous test. There is a reason I give you a full week to work on it. And it's not its not because I'm super kind, but it's because it's a lot of work. work. Um, but, you know, it is open book. And uh, if it asks you, ask you to do code, code maybe, consider maybe consider writing the code, writing the code and seeing if it executes. You have that, you have that ability. You're not, you're not working, working in a tight time, time frame here. You're, you're working in a elongated time, time frame. So you have the ability to answer all the questions, think deeply, deeply on them, and then go ahead and uh, and then evaluate or check them for correctness yourself. Do an assessment on them. And if for any reason you don't understand a question, it's okay to send me a Discord DM asking for clarifications, right? right? So if you don't know quite what you're answering, then ask me, like, like ask me like for some specificity in terms of what, what the question's really answer. asking for. So if it, you're kind of confused by it, don't, don't just necessarily leave it blank and move on. Okay, let's see here. Uh-oh, <laughs> let me see. see. Ah, there, there we go. Both microphones were on simultaneously. The poor internet crowd was hearing two of me in stereo. Okay, so with that said, does anyone have any questions? And again, uh, you you should have availability of all of the uh, YouTube lectures and the PowerPoint slides as well. And, um, and if you, this is one thing though, if I define a word, another thing I wanna highlight is if I define a word in a very particular way in the lecture, and if you've just so happened to come across a word used, but in a similar way through the internet, I won't give you credit for the internet definition because I wanna use the terminologies we established inside of the classroom. So I, I did notice that that was something that had happened sometimes on the, the test one. So I want you to be aware of the word choice is the uses of our words as it pertains to this class. Because unfortunately, the jargons inside of computer science are sometimes cross-shared amongst multiple domains. So when I talk about, like for instance, data modeling at the level we're at, I'm, uh, I'm talking about things like, uh, just to give an instance of the, the last test, I'm talking more about like designing the data that our application needs. But as you grow as a developer, I was going to start talking about design decisions that motivates how you build out a database architecture as well. And those are both data model designs, but at two different granular levels. So just keep that in mind when you go and do any kind of research to answer your question it has to pertain to what this particular class is about. So even if technically the answer might be correct in another domain, I'm evaluating your understanding of what we're learning here today. Okay. So. 
Does anyone have any questions about what we covered in last class or in homework <laughs> or how's everyone doing with homework at this point? Is everyone, has everyone started moving on to homework five, the array homework? Yeah. Is that your favorite one so far? What about homework six? That's the one we're going to be learning about how to do for this lecture. And then there's one more homework, there's homework seven. So keep in mind, we were what, November 1st right now. So I want to say the last, the last week of lectures is like December, like the first week of December. So you have about a month left now just to uh, just to make sure that you're on top of everything. Okay, so with that said, we're going to start unit three today. We're done with unit two. Thank goodness it was such a long unit. And so for unit three, we're going to get into object-oriented programming design. So again, we've staggered our way all the way to the entire point of this class. We started with algorithm design, that was unit one. Then in unit two, we went to dry design. So we're like, okay, we can design algorithms. How can we do that in a way where we minimize the amount that we repeat ourselves and then we learned how to build methods? So technically, what we learned how to do was what's called procedural programming, where we start breaking our algorithm down into a collection of smaller methods or procedures. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to, now that we've motivated this idea of an object or an instance from a class, which is what we're going to refer to as kind of building out an object, we're going to, we're going to use that as another leveling up tool for our code and say, well, how can we start designing our code as a collection of objects as opposed to a collection of methods? Or, and before that was just a collection of statements. So each time along the way, we're learning how to kind of break things down and encapsulate them, contain them in more and more meaningful ways. And so the real concept that motivates object-oriented programming is that we tend to think of things, concepts as objects in a, of themselves, like right? it's a very human-like experience since we live in a world of objects to think of things as objects. Think about what motivates the work of a true, of, a, of an engineer that's on the other side of campus, of a mechanical engineer, for instance, or like, uh, yeah, a mechanical engineer would make a great example. When they go to design, a piece of hardware, when they go to design something, it's usually constructed of physical objects that assemble together and build out a whole. So if you look at, say, for instance, a clock, for instance, a clock might be created out of a combination of small gears and uh, faceplate and the arms and the motor and everything else that's required that gets put together for the clock to operate, to tell you time. And each piece that's been installed, that's been integrated into the clock has a purpose towards the whole of what the clock provides, which is to tell time. And so ideally, if, it, that, if that piece didn't have a purpose, then you could remove it, right? So the idea is that you remove all the unnecessary pieces, you're left with, with just what is the bare necessity to make the clock work, and then you're ready to go into production, right? You ship that off, you can get it manufactured, and then you can start selling your clocks. So the same way that an engineer would approach, first of all, going on paper, designing out each of the individual pieces and then figuring out how those pieces work together to build a clock as a whole, we want to adopt that approach to start building out our software. We want to start thinking of all of the pieces of our software as actual software objects. And then when we start to plan out an application, we, what we really want to do is want to figure out what are the minimal amount of software objects, all that have their own kind of role inside of what our application is designed to do to fit together to create the application we seek. And so we're going to start talking about how we can do that with this concept of object-oriented programming. Okay, and so a quick overview of just what this entire unit's going to look like 
and things might get added into here depending on our time is that we'll talk a little bit about OOP, Object Oriented Programming Design. And so the first thing we're going to compare it to is going to be procedural programming versus uh, object oriented. Procedural programming, just so you know, is what we've been doing up to this point. Procedural just means it's it's method based. And so here we're finally going to pivot to our software being more object based. I think if you go and read the catalog, it's going to state that this entire class was an introduction into an object oriented approach. So you can see we kind of slowly evolve ourselves so that here in November, we can finally really start talking about this. But by now, we should have motivated it in such a way that you should see the value for what we're about to do. And it shouldn't be that different than what we've already been doing. You've already kind of seen objects a little bit. Uh, we'll just talk, start talking about how expressive they are, how powerful they are, and how we can start designing entire software systems around objects themselves. So yeah, we're gonna talk about how software is constructed from object types. I think I've just motivated that with uh, what we had uh, discussed with the clocks and what we'd like to try to get ourselves to here in terms of uh, our software development world as a software engineer uh, and then modeling things as types of objects. And then this is gonna be the big thing about objects is that we really want to take advantage of uh, abstraction and encapsulation and unit testability, modularity, and accountability. So we'll cover all of these concepts. These are like the five concepts that really drive why we want to adopt an object-oriented approach. And we'll actually see that as we start coding. But the, the big things here is that designing using an object-first metaphor allows us to abstract away everything that's part of our problem domain that's not a member of this object in and of itself. So before we can start talking about what makes up a mod and an object, we'll have to start talking about, well, how do we mod model with objects as opposed to how do we model with data? So we spent a lot of time talking about data modeling. Object modeling is built on top of that concept of data modeling, but allows us to start encapsulating our data into these object models. And then these object models will then be able to have object to object interactions that happens through methods. Methods allow objects to share code with other objects, just like methods allow classes to share code with other classes. So the same metaphor that we learned about how we can transmit, how we can have our code base interact with one another through, through the uh, interchange through the invocation of methods is going to be how objects communicate with one another as well. And then later on, not right now, but just to create a roadmap of where we're going with this, we're going to start building more complex versions of objects. So we talked about object to object interaction, where objects can have methods and they can get invoked by other objects. But you can also do object from object interactions. And what that means is you can build objects from other pre-existing objects. And there's several different ways we can do this. Uh, well, I say several, but there's really two main ways we can do this. Uh, it's composition and it's going to be through inheritance. And those are two different relationships. One is going to be, is a relationship. The other is going to be, has a relationship. And again, this is just establishing a roadmap. We'll talk more about that in the upcoming lectures that are going to happen later on this month. Then we'll finally talk about the root class that all objects are built from, which is the object class and what methods are defined inside of the object class and what implications that has for us. And then finally, we'll get into inheritance. So after we take a little delve into composition, we'll look at inheritance on how we can build objects from other objects and start seeing how we can build not only concrete uh, uh, classes, but we can build abstract classes and we can build interfaces and how all of that will serve us to start building out complex pieces of software. And once we get to that point, we'll have you pretty much well primed for 2120, the next, the next class where it'll have the base expectation that you know how to design software with an object oriented approach and then it'll also start showing you the tooling that you'd want to be able to start building software at a more professional level as opposed to an individual level how to start building software amongst teams of uh, people as opposed to just being uh, an individual based endeavor that you've been doing 
excellent. Okay, so, and I guess before we get into any uh, live coding, the one last thing that I just want to highlight here is that in terms of object-oriented programming design, the thing that really distinguishes Unit 3 is that we're moving from procedural programming, as I said before, where programs define smaller parts, which we called functions or methods. And so in object-oriented program, we're going to divide our smaller parts into what are called objects. And so here we will remove that because this isn't necessarily true. So we'll remove that on uh, that statement here. That's, this is what's good here. Because the last thing is, we'll actually see at the very tail end of the semester, going back to my overview, how we can use either a bottom-up object-oriented design approach to build out our application or top-down. It works both ways. You can actually build your hierarchical tree of object-to-object uh, -object interactions or object-from-object -object interactions from the base to the peak or from the peak to the base. And so we're going to start with a bottom-up approach, but by the time we get to the end of the semester, I want you to see how we could do the same thing using a top-down approach. And I'll explain what that means as we get there. First, let's just get into object modeling. So here, with object modeling, we're just going to learn how to start designing everything in our app as an object that then works together. And so here, we'll finally start taking advantage of some of these concepts, uh, such as the access type, like private versus public. And so typically, yeah. We want our fields or our variables to be private, and we're going to want our methods to be public. And so we're going to see why that is. And it all has to do with ensuring that we have a valid state. So we'll define that what that is as we move along. OK, so let's build out an application, or let's build out a class so that we can start doing some cool stuff with objects. And this will help motivate us somewhat along with uh, what we want to do. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so last class, when we were starting our concept of introducing how to build instances, we took the low hanging fruit examples. One of the easiest things, in my opinion, to start modeling are things that are analogous to real world objects, right? Because there's like a one-to-one -one mapping there. So recall when we were building our game, we had a like monster class, if I recall correctly, and a player class. And so those are clearly very discrete there. And by discrete, I mean, there's a boundary on that. When I say a player, you probably vividly can think of, well, what defines a player? And so looking at the games, then again, you can call back, you could do a look back at the games you've actually been creating for the homework, probably the properties that define a player. So one of the first things we do when we start designing our objects is we start with a UML class diagram. And so in our UL class, UML class diagram, you've probably seen these, these might be used in the homework. They might also be used in the future labs. So just so you understand how to read these, more importantly, so you know how to actually start using these to plan out your own software, uh, it's important to understand it, it consists of three different portions. So initially, you'll start at the very top. The top is going to be the name of your class. So if I wanted to make a player class, so let's do the, this right now. Let's, let's, let's make a new slide. And here we'll call this the player UML. And then what we'll do here is we're gonna do, uh, and actually let me do this. Let me insert uh, where the table, and it's gonna be three parts. Let's get rid of this, I don't need that. Okay, so I have this, I move this easily. Okay, let's move this here. And now we're gonna duplicate this. So let's take, a look back about what we did last class and start illustrating how we can use that to motivate how we start modeling with objects. So we've already done this in practice, 
So let's pretend that we designed it before building it first. So that's, that's typically where we want to come from. We want to design it and then build it. We don't want to build it, then design it. That's, that is, unfortunately, a lot of software developers actually do that. That is not a good way to design software. In fact, that's the antithesis of designing software. Uh, okay, so here for our UML, and so if you want to know what UML stands for, it's, it's, um, uh, it's Unified Modeling Language or UML. So whenever you see UML, UML is a well set of diagramming tools that allows us to start expressing the relationship of multiple things. UML actually exists at different granular levels. This might be the first time we're seeing in this class, but typically the, the two most common use cases you're gonna see for UML is to produce something that looks like a flow chart to be able to identify how you, the uh, flow of control across your algorithm works. So for instance, you can look at a UML diagram where a uh, while loop loops back on itself or like a selection statement branches into paths. Uh, so if you ever wanted to go ahead and create a flow chart of your algorithm just to be able to trace it, what happens at each level, you can do that. A more complex variant of UML is to go ahead and start modeling all of the individual objects inside your software system. So here, when I go to build out my game and I want to use this UML diagram to start identifying, to start building the responsibilities of each of my objects, I start by identifying an object. So my game needs to have a player. So I'm going to put that at the very top of my UML diagram. And the next thing that I need is I need to define what properties does a player have? These are the attributes of a player. These are definitive qualities of a player, right? Can anyone think of like what are definable attributes that a player might have? Um, okay, so a, so a player could potentially move, but when the player is moving, what does that mean? What, what inside of the player, so if the player moves up, what is actually happening inside the player or with the player? Y minus. So the player has to have a coordinates, a set, a position. So let's say a player has to have an X and a player has to have a Y, right? And when you move the player, what that means is the player is at a particular position. And in this instance, I've given the player an X, Y position. If I was modeling someone like you in the classroom, I might even give you a Z position, right? Because you actually have a depth uh, uh, dimension in, in reality. Uh, okay, but let's say that we'll abstract this away. We'll abstract away the third dimension. So we're saying that one of the properties of a player is where they're located. And if we think of directions as being something that's orthogonal, um, is that a word that everyone's uh, familiar with? Or So or, orthogonal just means that it's independent. Uh, so, and when I say independent, that means there's no dependence between the two. So I'll give you an instance for that. If you move left or right, that doesn't affect in any way your ability to move up and down, right? So left to right movement is independent from up and down movement. Does that much make sense? So we could say that the X axis is orthogonal to the Y axis. And so if we had another depth, such as, uh, or another axis like Z that doesn't go into the X or the Y axis, if it's independent, which means that no amount of movement in X and Y affects the property of Z, then you could say that Z is orthogonal to Y and Z is orthogonal to X. Um, your cardinal directions, right, or at least moving east or west and north or south, would also be orthogonal to one, one another. So orthogonal is just a way of expressing that you have two sets of independent variables. And so a an illustration of something that is not orthogonal would be, is everyone familiar with the formula for computing a line? 
what is the formula typically for computing the long run? You might have y is equal to, let's say, ax plus b, right? Does that sound fine? So where a is a scalar, and then b is some amount that you can go ahead and offset it by, right? So you have a scalar of that. The entire point of expressing, does, does this invoke anyone's memory? So if I want to express a line, any linear equation is effectively that. And then if I wanted to, I can have like AX plus, uh, or AX sub one plus BX uh, sub two plus C, right? That would also be a form of a linear equation because you're adding them all together. But the, those, but a, AX sub one and, um, let me show you. Okay, so here, if I had, y is equal to ax plus b, we could see x here, x here would be my independent variable, and y here would be a dependent variable. y is dependent on the value of x to have meaning, but y is affected by the value of x. Therefore, y is not orthogonal to x. Does that help? kind of bridge the, the gap between what is orthogonal and not orthogonal. So a change in X will change the value of Y. So Y becomes dependent on the value of X. Okay, so that's completely an aside, but one that I think is worth uh, just kind of talking about and being aware of as we start just communicating in the confines of computer science. Computer science is very technically kind of a subdomain of math, but, uh, more like an abstracted form. It's, it focuses more on processes than it does uh, proofs. Okay, so we have X, we have Y, which are both spatial properties of our player, but they're orthogonal, so they can be ex expressed independently. What else do we have that might, ex uh, that might define what a player does? or is properties of a player. Some sort of character. Okay, so, so a representation. So for the purposes of the game that we've been building, usually we've been referring to like an image file. So I'm gonna use something more expressive like an image. Uh, a player might also have a name, right? So maybe you can name the player. Is there anything else that you think we could use to model a player? So yeah, so physics might be a attribute that might be, uh, especially if you're doing homework seven, because you'll see that uh, that's the platformer game where we actually do implement something like gravity to go ahead and actually uh, have our character move around in. And so physics is, so typically, this is fun. So when we talk about physics, a common, thing that all entities that are subject to the rules of physics is to have a body. And so this is this is this is a true thing for almost any application that's gonna that's going to model any kind of physics based uh, um, interactions. So here we would say our player has a body. A body means that it is something that can be registered with the physics subsystem of our application so that anything else that has a body can also uh, can also have the rules of physics applied to it. And that could be like collision detection, that could be like gravity, that could be anything. In fact, a lot of times this is called rigid body physics, if you've ever heard that phrase. So if you start seeing these things while you're fiddling around, this, this is what they're talking about. So yeah, so if we wanted a game that had physics, we'd have a rigid body on our player in addition to an X, Y position, in addition to an image and a name. Anything else? And think about it, if you don't have a, if you don't have a rigid body, then you're effectively a ghost. And I don't think ghosts are inhibited by physics. Right? They just float through walls and things like that. Okay, so this seems good enough here. So the next thing I do though is I need to express while I'm designing my UML, what type of data each one of these properties are gonna be modeled as. 
So like I said earlier, object modeling is built on top of data modeling. At the end of the day, we're still having to resolve all of our algorithms as a collection of effectively primitive data types, right? It still has to resolve into a collection of values. But what we're starting to see is that these values can start being grouped together to define the properties, the attributes, the features of an object. So we can start grouping things in terms of building out objects. Here we're building out a player and we said what a player is inside of a game would be an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, a name for the player, an image for the player, a rigid body. Other things that a player might have is um, uh, maybe a strength. It could be a defense, right? It could be uh, a amount of hit points. Right, it could be amount of, uh, and let's call these this HP. It could be uh, an amount of experience points. It could be a, an amount of magic points. Right, like keep thinking about what kind of game you're building, and you could probably keep listing more and more attributes that are meaningful for the application at hand. So that's what we're doing here. Is what we're starting to do is abstract things. Let me take a step away from player for just a moment, and, uh, and challenge you with something similar yet slightly different. What if I ask you to explain, to model as an object, a student at UNO? Okay, so actually, let's do this. Instead of keeping this abstract, let's jump up here and let's put UNO <laughs> student. Great. Okay, so so here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put UNO student. Actually, though, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bridge the gap, though. So I'm going to make it a legal thing. So there we go. So that it's a, so that it's a one to one mapping for what the class name will actually be. So here I have UNO student. Okay, so we said grade. So how do grades? So are grades usually listed as a overall GPA? Is it a collection? So we'll, we'll talk about that later. So we have grades, what else is there that defines a UNO student? Like, so you could think about yourself. So there's a student ID number. What else do all students have at UNO? What's that? Name. Yeah, a name, right? And probably, I don't know, when you go in there, is there an option for a first name and a last name? Are those separate or are those the same? Okay, so we'll put first name, we'll put last name. Okay, what else? So you have grades, you have a student ID, you have a first name, you have a last name. Is that everything? Yep, yeah, yeah, major, perfect. So what's on the transcript? So let's see, so what is a transcript? Okay, so let's, that sounds like a complicated thing. So here I'm gonna create something called the transcript. <laughs> gonna erase this. I'll put transcript here and I'll put that a student has a transcript, but that's so, that's such a vague thing. And by vague thing is I, that brings up to the next point that I want to bring up. When we say you have a student ID, how can I model that? How can I express that? What is that? Is that something that I can express with a primitive data type? Or do I need another object that's more feature rich, that's more expressive than just a singular primitive value? Well, what is a student ID in the confines of, uh, of UNO? It's, so it seems to be numerical, but let me ask you this. Is there a specific number of digits on it? Count up, think internally, don't say out loud, especially since everyone's being recorded, but think internally and count how many digits are in your student ID. And then I'm gonna query and see if everyone has the same number of digits. Okay, I'll give you a, a moment just to do that. Okay, how many digits is your student ID? Seven. So, yeah. yeah, so, okay, so. This brings up an interesting point because I'm willing to wager, so I'm gonna put this,
but I'm also going to put a caveat that it's seven digits. So this causes kind of a slight issue that we might not be super aware of. Because I'm, I'm willing to bet that your student ID is made of nothing but integer numbers, right? Yours, yours, right? No letters. Okay. So it seems like this is the perfect candidate for an integer model. However, what if your student ID was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? And I save that as an integer. What would happen? What would I get back if I go to ask for the student ID? One, two. How many digits is that? I lose one. You see why I lose one, right? Because any number that's prefixed with a zero it doesn't really count towards the magnitude of that number. Whereas it is a significant digit for something like an ID. This is a very real realization right here that you should consider that even though something might be able to be modeled as a integer, if it's nothing but integer numbers, however, there's an additional constraint like it has to be a certain number of characters, it's probably better to model that as a string then because a string guarantees that each individual character will be saved as a representation of whatever that characteristic is, so an ID. So would everyone say that even though those are all seven digit numbers, it makes more sense to save the, the ID of a student as a string? Because we can guarantee that if we save it with seven characters, we're gonna get back something that's seven characters. And therefore, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, will equal zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, which might not be the true if we compare two numbers, right? Which would just be one, two, three, four, five. Th this is really important when you start doing things like pin numbers, right? Because that, that becomes insane when you compare pin numbers. And then if someone can guess your pin number, let's say your pin number was like zero, like one, two, three, or zero, one, zero, one, or something like that. Then like some software that's trying to hack your pin code if it treated it as an integer as opposed to a string, would be able to like guess without having to remember or recall the front zeros. The front zeros would be arbitrary. They'd be meaningless, right? They wouldn't actually be encoding anything. Okay, so we will save that as a string. That's neither here nor there. Just another illustration of why we want to use strings as opposed to ints for things like IDs. So what about the first name? What kind of data type might we want to model with the first name? String, right? So that is something we can probably go ahead and use something that's effectively a primitive type. What about last name? That's also a string. What about a major? Oh man, character. Okay, we'll come back to transcript. What about grades? We talked about grades. How might we represent a grade? So I'm assuming when we say grades, what we really mean here is GPA. Is that? And so here we'll do we'll do a float or we'll do a double. So notice the next thing I do when I'm designing out my UML is the first thing I do is identify what is the object that I'm thinking deeply on that I want to try to find the properties of. Then in the second panel, I'm going to define the properties that are critical for what our problem domain is at. So you know other things that might define a UNO student but aren't important to this application. It might be blood pressure, right? It might be your, um, your heart rate, right? It might be your insulin level. Like these are all things that define you as a human, but it doesn't make sense to include that stuff for UNO students. It could be like your uh, foot size or your height or your or any one of these other concepts that you can look at and say, this is a property that's true for everyone who builds up the UNO student population, but does that have any meaning for managing a group of UNO students inside of an application, like in the confines of their role as a student? See, so there's sometimes, so there's this thing when we're modeling to only select the features of properties that make sense for how you plan to use that object.
Okay, so here we'll just go ahead and identify the properties. And those properties are always going to represent themselves in our class inside of uh, all of our objects as a collection of fields or a collection of variables. And so these will, each student can be uniquely different from the other student. So clearly we're gonna start using instance fields or instance variables to represent those. Okay. So then the next thing we have to do, oh, we have this last one, transcript. What is a transcript? Well, what, what does a transcript represent? Like, yeah, so that could be like the courses you took. So um, here I could do this in one of two ways. Probably what we could do is for the, for this purpose, maybe we could model that as a string array. Probably what you'd want to do in the future, though, is say, well, a transcript is a little too complicated. And there's probably behavior you want to do in the transcript, like query it for specific data, like uh, what was the courses taken at like fall of 2022 or spring of 2023 or, or, you know, what was the grade associated with that course? And so notice that's a complex thing such that you probably want to model that as a class itself and build the student to have a reference towards a transcript instance. Does that make sense? So probably what you want. So at this level, we could say, oh, a transcript might just be a string array. That's a collection of the courses. But honestly, you'd probably want to make the transcript a reference to some transcript. And then you would go into your transcript and say, oh, this would be a, let's say a, um, let's say it might be semesters. So these are the semesters you're registered in. And this might be represented as some kind of array, some kind of array of, uh, of well, you might call it semesters, but let's not do that. Let's say we'll do something like uh, classes as a string array and let's say you have your grades as a um, double array. So maybe a transcript is a string, it's two strings that that kind of match up with one another where one represents the classes. Uh, you know, I'm going to use courses because classes has a very specific word in Java. So one is our set of courses and the other is our set of grades. So now if I put transcript here, what this means is, oh, there's this other object that I'm gonna build later on. That's gonna be a collection of courses and grades. And so when I see transcript here, what I can think of is this other complex entity that's built of properties, but the properties that expresses is a collection of grades and a collection of courses. Does that make sense? So do you see how I start to like create all the, and this happens during the design phase. Like notice we just started modeling this by default. And I'm glad you gave me transcripts because that represented a non, a, a complex relationship that a UNO student has. Like it was something that's more expressive than a primitive value than something that's a string or a double, or what about something like this? Probably another thing that we would have inside of a student would be, um, is are they currently registered? And that this could be expressed as like a Boolean value, right? Okay, so then the next thing, the third pane we have here, are what are the behaviors? that this object should be able to perform. Let's jump back to the player for this instance. So here I'm gonna remove some of these other things that I have so I can have a more simplified version of a player because we really, I went really off the wall by, by adding a lot of fields into my player, creating a very expressive player. So here, what things can a player do? So here, these are the actions our object can take. So the fields represented properties that define the object. And so whenever we have an object where its properties have a set of values, 
So like when we create an instance of a player and let's say we give the player the name Ted and let's say we give the player the, the X and Y coordinates of three and four and let's say we give a JPEG image to our player, then this player is what we call has state because we've set values to all the instance fields, to all the instance variables. And so one of the beautiful things about object-oriented programming is with the use of instances, we can build as many instances of players that all have their own state. So whenever you hear the word state in reference to computer science, what we mean to say is that we built an instance that has a set of values at any particular time. So a instance state can change over time. The name can change from Ted to Bob. The X, Y position can change from three to four, three and four to four and four and five and four. So one of the cool things about objects are they're stateful. They remember their state. They have memory that can mutate over the course, that can evolve over the course of our application. And each instance maintains its own state. Sorry, can I have a uh, Yeah, it's inside my office. Okay. So here, uh, the next thing is, so in addition to having state, typically the other thing our objects can do is to have behaviors. And just like in the real world, where you have the ability to walk and talk and think of, think of behaviors as verbs, right? So if you think of our, um, the fields as properties, and so properties are very expressive. It's, it's a way that you might define as a, uh, as a set of list items what someone is, right? So when thinking of building a data model, you first start with what is it that I'm trying to model? Then you use effectively a list of properties that is expressive by a name. And so you can use the same rules you'd use for an English writing class to be very descriptive in terms of what those properties are. When you think of behaviors, think of them as action verbs that the object can take. So what are, what are the properties of a player? Movement. So we, we, we would have move, we would have attack. Um, yeah, we could have talk. We can have um, yeah, we can have jump if we want. So these are all could be actions that our player can engage in. And so here, let's do the same thing with player that we did with our UNO student to be more expressive here. So now you can see how we start to fill up our three pane box, our UML class diagram. So inside of here, typically, I not only give the name of my property, but then I would give a colon, and then I'd say, I give myself a reference of how I plan to model this. So how can we model our X position for our player? That could be an if, right? Because usually we're gonna be operating on a grid in this instance. What about our Y? And then let's say we want to also have a width. And let's say we want to have a height. So it would be the width of our player. It could be a double. That's fine. I mean, we, we're, we're the ones who are modeling it right now. We just, what we're doing though, is we're building a contract with our future self. So we're letting ourselves know that these are going to be the properties that our object is going to have. So when we build any behaviors, when we build any logic, that uses this object, it just has to know that width and height are gonna be doubles. That, that, that might be perfect, because maybe you want the width and the height to be like 3.5. And you wouldn't have that if it was integer. Maybe it could only be three or four. So, I mean, doubles give you more flexibility in this regard. Uh, what about image? Image is a, yeah, probably a path name, right? But this is where you think about, well, what makes up an image? Oh, got 
a suggestion on here, we should have the ability to heal, uh, which means I should put back probably hit points, which I will say is an integer. Okay, and finally a name, and we'll say the name is a string. Okay, so we're slowly building out our player. And so notice inside of the second pane where we define all the properties, all of our instance fields, after we give a descriptive name about what that object has, we then map it to how we intend to model it inside a job. At the end of the day, you have to eventually get to a collection of models that resolve to be primitive values. Right? And, and I clump things like strings as that, like text, uh, down to your rudimentary data types. We said there's like fundamentally three rudimentary data types, right? Numerical, text, and Boolean. So everything at the end of the day resolves down to one of those types of data. Uh, but sometimes you got to make models that kind of cascade to that point. And to jump back to this example, like with UNO student, we had almost all primitive data types, all primitive values until we got to transcript. And then transcript is a little too complex really to model as a primitive data value itself. So we made another UML that says, oh, that could be a collection of courses and a collection of grades. So at the end of the day, effectively a transcript represents a string array and a double array. So if I follow that chain of thought, I see eventually I do get down to my most fundamental data types. Okay, so here I fortunately have all my fundamental data types described for my player. And the next thing I do is I would make suggestions on what type of data we need to pass into our behavior. So here we're giving, we're giving names to the behavior that our player has, but that's not just enough. We also have to illustrate, well, what does this behavior require from the outside? And then what does it get back after it's done performing? So for instance, when we move, do we have to provide anything to move to make it make sense? Yeah, and so it's probably gonna be a new X and a new Y, right? Which is going to be an int and is gonna be an int. So if you require data to be passed into this method, into this behavior to make the object be able to perform its task, then we're gonna put that inside the parentheses and next to it, just like what we did with the instance fields, we're also gonna put the type of data that would have to be passed in. And then here, do we, and then we have to ask ourselves, when we do move, it changes the state of our player, right? So move is we might give a new X, Y position, and we're going to update the X and Y here. Does it give back anything? Does it return back a value? Probably not, right? Probably changes the state of the character and that's it. Okay. What about attack? What might attack do? Oh, and then, so if I have attack, maybe let me give myself an AP here, which represents my attack power. So, so an attack, does it require anything as input? Yeah. What might it require as input? Oh, like a space bar. Well, so that could be something that triggers the action on it, but in terms of having the player to attack. So right now, and this is a good point, like right now we wanna divorce from our thought process, the user actions that cause the behavior from the player versus what the player's behavior is inside of just the software application. So the user interactions are gonna be things that are usually gonna be controlled by what's called a controller and the, the results of what gets depicted to the player are usually gonna be a responsibility of what's called the view. And so we want our model to be kind of agnostic, unknowing about what causes its attack action to trigger, right? We might wanna bind it to a keyboard key, but we might wanna bind it to a mouse key, or we might wanna bind it to a touch gesture, 
or we might want to bind it to a, a command line uh, implementation. So one of the cool things about de developing software in this object-oriented approach is we create this like object of a player and it has all of the methods and the, me the beautiful thing about the methods is that is our interface into the player. So when we have this, mo this, this model, we want everything that's inside of it to be accountable to that player instance. We don't want anything outside of the player to say what its attack power is or what its health power is or what its X or Y coordinate is. So I make these, so I'm gonna put minus signs in front of these, right? So I'm glad that you actually mentioned this because this is an, an important concept is that it's not just inside of the instance fields, these instance variables where everything uh, is defined but we should also make it private so that no other class has direct access to a player's fields. Because think about what a violation that would be. Then a monster could just access the player's fields and set the HP to zero, set the AP to zero. We don't want any change to the player's attributes to happen from anywhere else except for within the player. And the reason why is that ensures that we provide accountability. If our player enters an invalid state, let me give you an instance of an invalid state. Let's say, is it possible? Is, do you think it's valid for width to be a negative number? Do you think it's valid for height to be a negative number? Well, should it be valid that for an image to have a null value? Should it be possible for the AP, the attack power, to be a negative power? Imagine if what attack power was, was represented the amount of damage you did. If suddenly that became negative, every time you hit a monster, it would heal it, right? Because it'd be a negative of a negative number. So there's certain situations when we start building out these models, we have an expectation of what we consider to be a valid state. And sometimes the valid state and the legal state are two separate things. The legal state is anything that is an integer number for X and Y. That could be a negative value. But does a negative value make sense in the way that we're programming our game for X and Y to be a legal coordinate? So it's, a, I'm sorry, it's not a valid value for a, a coordinate, but it's a legal value for an integer. So you can have a legal value for X and Y, but it could be, it can invalidate the way we're using it in terms of modeling a coordinate. Does that make sense? So when you think of how you're using your numbers, sometimes they have a tighter scope than the actual uh, primitive data type. We're gonna talk more about this as we build out other models, but this is an important concept just to motivate. This is why we want all of our fields to be private. Cause we don't, we want, cause we're going to think deeply about how we're using each of those fields for this particular model. And so whenever we mutate those fields, whenever we change states, we can use the set of rules that we're ab and abide by those rules to ensure that our instances always remain in a valid state. Like we never want our state to go invalid. And what that means is like having a negative X or a negative Y or a negative width or a negative height. Other if, and if we, if we make our instance variables public, it not only gives every other class and object access, direct access to the instance variables in this particular class, but then we can't guarantee that we would have proper state. And now other classes would have to know the rules that govern the state of this class. And that's outside of the, the, that's outside of the expectations of what other classes should know. Remember, we're trying to abstract and encapsulate. Encapsulate means we data, we hide our data in the class by making it private and we expose it through the methods. The methods are what's going to be public and the methods are effectively going to be the API for all the other objects inside of our software to be able to interface, to be able to talk to, to be able to uh, uh, exchange or uh, interact with one another. So these, I'm going to put plus signs. The plus signs represent what has the public access type, whereas the minus sign represents what we have 
private. So here, when we move, this is public, move can be called by another piece of code somewhere else on the software, it can supply an XY value, and that's how the XY state of the player will change. And then inside of that move method is where you could put in your constraints, where it's like, well, if you try to move in a negative place, ignore it. So here we can actually enforce our rules to ensure our player always remains in a valid state. And again, this motivates a concept of accountability. When your software breaks down, if it hits erroneous, like some kind of strange erroneous behavior, and it's not producing the results you think it should, by ensuring that all the data is private to each individual instance, it lets you know where to go in your code base when something's not working. If everything had access to everything else, if it was all just a global uh, scope that you're working in, you'd have to look at every piece of code potentially to see where the breakdown is at. So again, accountability is super important for building software, just like it is for managing any large scale institutions. I mean, you have accountability at UNO, right? Like each person who has a job here has a particular role that they're accountable for. Because if no one had that accountability, who would you go to when there was a breakdown in the ordering and the way that things functionally worked? So the same approach you take for like business management and delegating tasks across a pool of people is the same way we're gonna delegate tasks and have a functional application working. So they kind of, these theories kind of cross over conceptually between project management and software engineering. Okay, so uh, attack, that, so that brought me. So all of that was discussed because we said attack might be triggered by um, uh, like an action from the user. And so the idea is that attack will be a public method so that some other entity, like let's say a controller instance, a keyboard controller instance would look for the player to hit like the space bar and then it would tell the player, do your attack method. And you'll, you'll probably see that in some of these future homeworks where you start building a controller class that you register the player with and then the controller class will look for certain actions to occur on the keyboard and, and trigger the player instance based off of the interaction with the player. So you will actually see what exactly you were mentioning. You'll see how we can handle that in an object-oriented platform. That's one thing you'll see probably in homework six, certainly in homework seven. Okay, uh, but other than that, how might we think, what does attack do? Let's. So uh, let's say attack doesn't require anything. Let's say when we do the attack, it gives us back the amount of damage to apply to something else, right? So maybe attack lets us know. So maybe it gives us back um, an integer value, which represents the amount of damage the attack does. Uh, talk, maybe what talking does is it gives back a string, which is the text that our player provides. Jump. Might not have to take either input or output, because jump might be just like, oh, you increment on the y-axis. So this is an example where we don't have to uh, define an output or an input. And for heal, maybe what we need is we need the amount of health. So like a heal value, which would represent it as, a heat, as an integer value. And so that would add to, which means we should also have a damage, which would be the damage, which would be represented as an int itself. Okay, so here, what you're thinking of that bottom as is it's not just a set of behaviors that the object can exhibit, but it's also effectively the API you're designing for other objects to be able to interface with this object on how it's gonna work, how it's gonna operate within your application. Excellent. So does anyone have any questions regarding the UML diagram of, of this? And so here you can see, we kind of did that loosey goosey last class where we just created a class and we created some instance fields and we created methods. But before you actually start implementing any code, 
you should always consider building out your UML diagrams because it gives you a chance to think deeply about what are all the properties that define each of the objects that are going to go in your application. How are you going to define those properties in terms of the fundamental data types that it's going to express them? And then what are going to be the speed, set of behaviors that object's going to need to be performative, to be uh, accessible, to be able to do its job in the application? And then those methods can then be called by other objects inside your software system which is effectively what we were doing when we were building that game last time, right? We built methods that were publicly available. We built our uh, instance variables, but we didn't list them as private yet, but now you know why they should be. Okay, so, so far, what we've been modeling has been relatively simple stuff, things that are concrete representations that have clear boundaries like player, and monster and UNO student. This is where it got to be kind of interesting to me today, where we, when, when we're doing UNO student and we're like, ah, oh, UNO students have a transcript. Cause that to me is a non-obvious object in and of itself. And this will happen routinely when you start, and really what should be the motivation behind building an object shouldn't be, is it a well concrete like thing, right? Like that's a good way to motivate the very initial starting of building out an object. But at the end of the day, an object is simply a concept that where you want to group data that's more complex, that has more than one value, that has more than one thing that needs to keep track of. So up until now, I don't know if I would have considered a transcript as this really kind of clear distinguished boundary, but when you think about it, you're like, well, I can't just ex express it as a string. I can't just express it as a string array. I can't express it as a number. I can't express it as a boolean. So when I run through my head and say, can I express it as a number, a boolean, or text? And I say no. I'm like, well, can I represent it as a collection of strings or a collection of booleans or a collection of numbers? And I say no to those. So I hit six no's. I'm like, well, I'm going to have to represent this as an object. And then I give it a name, like transcript, or probably another thing that it makes sense, honestly, going back to player is it probably doesn't make sense to have X and Y individual to the player. Probably what I'd want to do, honestly, is to create like a chord, which would be of a coordinate data type. And then that would be an X and Y value because a player shouldn't be responsible for knowing what is a valid X and Y coordinate that's really outside the job of a player. If you are hired in the role of a player and they're like, oh, you also have to know what is valid for X and Y, you'd probably be like, oh, that's outside my wheelhouse, right? That's not what I got hired for. That's not what's on my resume. And he's like, you should have something else that manages whether my, like, where my GPS locations are valid or not. Or like if a player like had a date, for instance, let's say we're making a user for a Facebook profile and it has a date. You probably don't want to manage all the logic for what makes up a valid date, like month, year, and day inside of a user property, right? Like, oh, is, uh, is this the appropriate leap year? No, you probably want to have another type, like date type, that manages all the concepts, that decides whether it's a valid date or not. So the same things we were talking about, why we want our players to be private, we want to try to abstract all the complexity that a player shouldn't be involved in and put that into some other object. And then, then our player can just be dependent on these other objects to do their jobs, to say whether it's a valid coordinate or whether it's a valid date or whatever, right? Okay, so I've run out of time today. I think we've motivated a lot of the modeling decisions and how we can start building out our applications. And so next class, we're actually gonna build out some code using this approach. We're gonna start with a UML diagram We'll walk through it and then we'll build a application with it. Excellent. I will see you all next class. Um, I emailed you about one of my class for things that wasn't graded yet. Yeah. Hang on. Let me, this is freezing up on me again. Yeah, I, I've been super busy recently. <laughs>
Okay. So I just I I just got a little bit more 